So the background to this is that the 1992 constitution, which we all massively voted for, and which is the constitution that has applied in Ghana um, for the longest lasting constitution and the most successful, was drafted by a group of people, consultative assembly, represented by all over the country. But they put in these clauses uh, in the constitution, and it is these clauses that dictate that we now have to have the local government system that we now have. Now, what we are finding out is that there was a, a particular difficulty. And if you look at Ghana's political history, of course, we know that already from Nkrumah to Buzia to Achampon, uh, Lehman, and, and then Rawlings. Flight Lieutenant Rawlings, upon his second coming in 1981, was determined to rule Ghana for a considerable uh, length of time. That has become very obvious to any political scientist or any researcher. Rawlings' first coming was not entirely in his control. And this was the June 4th uprising where he was released from prison. He was taken to, to broadcasting house to speak to, in, uh, to broadcasting and, and to broadcast that he was the, uh, the leader of the coup d'etat. And that coup d'etat was intended to end all coups as one of the main architects of the coup, Wachijan would have us believe. Executions were conducted and they stepped back and then organized elections and elections were won by a certain political party. But when Flight Lieutenant Rawlings returned in 1981, it appeared that he was determined to rule Ghana for a long time. But he could not resist the pressures that were coming upon him from the international community, especially from sometime in 1987. The pressure began to build on the PNDC military junta that they should hand over power. I'm talking about how the district assembly were made to operate the way that they are operating today. Now, this international pressure on the military junta then got the intellectuals in the PNDC to begin to think about how to ease Flight Lieutenant Rawlings, who was the, the, the lion in the room, uh, how to ease him, but he was a popular lion, by the way, and how to ease him out into constitutional rule. This was, the, this was the big issue that confronted the members of the Provisional National Defense Council. So a group of them, uh, the leading thinkers among them, decided that they were going to find a way to ease Rawlings out easily. To do that, you had to introduce a constitution that did not detract from the powers that the military junta operated. It did not detract from the powers that the military junta had in terms of... Uh, prosecuting the government agenda. The PNDC as a military junta had some powers in terms of the way they prosecute the government agenda. They appointed the police head, they appointed the military heads, they appointed uh, heads of uh, government departments, heads of government bank. Every appointment was made by the military junta. And they wanted Flight Lieutenant Rawlings to feel comfortable to move into a democratic situation. Um, and so that democratic situation in terms of the constitution that will be presented to Rawlings must be indicative of that particular desire. It must maintain, hold, and express that desire in all its colors to satisfy the military junta that moving away from military rule to democratic rule will not take away anything from Flying Lieutenant Rawlings. Jerry John himself was hostile to the democratization of the process. And in the period of 1989 and 1987 and 1988, J.J. went around the country and almost every time he spoke, he had opportunity or he found opportunity to criticize politics and politicians of old. J.J. always found opportunity to do that. Have a look at this video. This was sometime in 1988 when J.J. was speaking to some people. And there again, he criticized the old politicians. He did not like to move to become a democratic leader. This is J.J. At least we can stand our ground with dignity. When you decide to insult that dignity, that one, you're asking for trouble. Sometimes these politicians can come and steal from you. They will do you in, but at the end of the day, they'll come and sit with you and drink small pito or come and eat small kenke with you. The fact that he's big man, he's doing this with you, you seem to overlook some of his faults. So, so you see the, the posture of Mr. Rawlings there. Now let's get into some more details and some more confessions here from Dr. Obeda Samoa and Mr. Kwame Ahoy, who give some confessions about how this whole process was organized. So it was the organization of this process, the way that it was done, that got the district assemblies to be the way they are, nonpartisan, and you'll find out later that it wasn't actually nonpartisan. The PNDC organized it, but nonpartisan 
and uh, people should uh, be, not be elected, the president was going to appoint. So those who were elected were elected on a partisan, partisan basis. That's the assembly members. The, the, the boss of the district, which was the district chief executive, or the municipal chief executive, or the mayor for that matter, was to be appointed by the president so that it maintains the power that the military junta had over the local government arrangements. Here is uh, uh, first Dr. Uh, uh, Obeda Samoa talking to us in 2016 during a documentary interview about the circumstances of the time. The military junta that overthrew the, uh, the government of Kwame Nkrumah did not form themselves into a political party to participate. They didn't do that. Once again, fast forward to 1979. The military junta, the AFRC, led by J.J. Rawlings, that overthrew the existing system, did not participate in the elections. The AFRC did not convert themselves into a political party to not participate in the elections. As military men, they believed that they had done justice to the Republic of Ghana. They had saved their nation by what they call the house cleaning, completing the house cleaning, and therefore they exited themselves out, organized the elections as a referee, and allowed the winner to win and allowed the political process to flow once again. This was very different, and this was the first time in the history of this republic and in the history of many African countries that a military junta that was to organize the elections wanted also to participate because Flight Lieutenant Rawlings wanted to stay in power for longer than the 10 or 11 years that he had done by the time the pressure was on him to democratize. So they had to ease him, convince him to ease him from a military ruler onto a civilian ruler. To do this, the constitution that was presented to him had to be such that um, his powers as military will be the same. That is why the local government system is what it is. So we'll come and show you that this local government system was, was created, it was stirred up, it was cleverly orchestrated and constructed for a single selfish purpose. That selfish purpose expired in 1993. That is why for 35 years the local government system has not worked. Because the whole system, as you see it, was created for a selfish purpose. To ease Fly Lieutenant Rawlings and his military junta into a constitutional arrangement. This confession has been made by Dr. Obeda Samoa and Professor Kwame Nahoy. We're going to show it to you now. So first here, Obeda Samoa, who talks about how at that time they had to decide to be part of the election, as unlike it had been before, that some of them even didn't want that, but he and other people wanted it. Here is Obeda Samoa. Well, the 92 campaign, you know, we, first of all, we, uh, there was an argument within the PNDC as to whether we could just return the country to constitutional rule or whether the PNDC should promote a political party. And I was one of the uh, <coughs> advocates of the PNDC for promoting a political party. I advocated very strongly that we should try and set up a political party which would promote the values of the PNDC. I said, it's not enough just to get, get out of uh, office, you know. We should, if you believe in what you are doing and you believe that those values were worth uh, 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 continuing. continuing, then we should set up a party that will continue those values. So you heard Dr. Obeda Samoa. Professor Kwame Nahoy corroborates that position in this way. Let's listen to Professor Kwame Nahoy. And all of these interviews were recorded in 2016. Yes, Kwame Nahoy. PNDC also did something which is not very generally known. It was very concerned about its own popularity and whether, because it didn't have a political tradition, it could win an election. Because there were, there, there were internal debates about whether we should disperse and go back to our original parties, form a new party, or try and take over one of the existing parties, you know. And so, with this arrangement, how was the PNDC going to put themselves together in the system? What role were the district assembly supposed to play? The district assembly election that had occurred in 1988, what role were they supposed to play? And Kwame Nahor is going to reveal a secret and the real reason why the district assemblies were created the way they were created under Article 55 of the Constitution, and Article 243 of the Constitution, 243 allows the president to appoint district chief executive. 55 says that make it nonpartisan. Kwame Nahor is revealing why they did that. And they did it for the purpose of the 1992 election. They put it in the Constitution. And that has been our local government system since. We are saying tonight that the purpose that was created for the local government system as it is today was a selfish purpose. 
It was a very clever thing to do, but it was selfish, and it was designed for a singular reason. So when that reason expired, the local government system has become superfluous, is irrelevant, is incoherent, it has no purpose for any Ghanaian living in Ghana today. Here's Kwame Nahoy revealing the secret of why this was done and how it was done. Because the district assemblies had also come into existence, and the elections to the assemblies had been fought on individual basis, not on partisan basis. Whoever controlled the district assemblies actually controlled the politics at the time. Because every assembly elected assembly member needed a local organization to work for him. Now, this is one of the things that the parties who were in opposition did not realize and they did not, they did not appreciate. But the PNDC was very much aware of it. So they made sure that a lot of cadres, other people, actually contested the district assembly elections. And you needed 25 people to sponsor you to be a candidate for the district assembly elections. And those people usually became the core of your organizational, uh, organizational base. So it was very easy for the NDC, when it came into existence, to take over the support basis of the individual elected assembly members and then use them as the core of their organization, which is, which is what you know, made it possible for uh, the NDC to win. So you had Kwame Nahoy, and later on this will be on video on demand, so you can forward and rewind as often as you want. But that was Kwame Nahoy, okay? He spoke to us in 2016 as part of a documentary uh, that we were recording with him. Now, there's another reason, uh, and, and um, it, this just also feeds into the whole conversation, that the PNDC were worried that for the first time they were the military junta and they were easing themselves into democratization. They were not sure whether flight Lieutenant Rawlings was actually going to, they were not sure whether they were going to win this election. They were not sure whether they were going to win both the presidential election and the parliamentary election. So in that election, the, uh, the voting was split. And Kwame Nahoy once again reveals why they decided to split the voting of the presidential election away from the parliamentary election. Younger people will not understand because for the last eight elections or so, we vote presidential and parliamentary in the same, on the same day. But for your information, younger people, in 1992, the people of Ghana did not have that opportunity. Kwame Nahoy is going to tell us why, as the military junta and as the referees and players at the same time, they decided to change, to, to have a different date for the voting of the presidential election, which was in November, and then a different date for the voting of the parliamentary election. We've never done that again since 1996, so you might not have the experience. But those who were alive then and those who have read the books know that this is what happened. This is Kwame Nahoy's confession of why they did that. The other thing also was the fact that the elections of that year were split. You know, we had the presidential before the parliamentary. I suspect that was because the PNDC, on their analysis, realized that President Rollins was very popular, and that he would win the presidential, and that if he won the presidential, that would have you know, an effect on the parliamentary. And that is exactly what happened. He won the presidential, the opposition boycotted the parliamentary, and I'll tell you something very interesting. So the first parliament of the Fourth Republic was a de facto one-party parliament. But it also enabled President Rollins to adapt to the demands of constitutionalism more easily than if the opposition had been in parliament from day one. It would have been very, very difficult for him, you know, because somebody who, I mean, not just him, all of us, we had been used to having our way for 10 years, and suddenly everything you said was, it was to be being challenged in parliament. It was, it was going to be very difficult. So it helped. So you now understand it. Uh, we will not belabor the point, but this is the background we wanted to share with you. So this is the background from where we have come. That is why you have those articles in the Constitution, not just those articles, but there are three or four or so articles that empower the president in a certain way. One of them is Article 243 that we are talking about now, which is the president's powers to appoint uh, the district chief executive. Ghana is the only country where that happens, where president is appointing district chief executive. Ghana is really the only country where that happens. And then 
You have Article 55, where they say that uh, do it non-partisan in a non-partisan way. They put that in the Constitution, but the purpose was for them to have their cadres in there so that the cadres will become the, the platform upon which they will control the country and upon which they win the election. You can decide whether that is a noble objective to have constitutional articles designed in a way to protect a military junta and to protect the ambition of Flight Lieutenant Rawlings and his friends who wanted to continue in power, or you can decide that that is not a noble way to put a national constitution together. A living organism and a living document to guide the future of the nation should not be written with parochial interest because some people have power. But this is precisely what happened, and that's why we're dealing with this local government matter. It was written with parochial interest because they were in power and they wanted to stay in power. That's all. That's why we have those articles in the Constitution. Another article we have in the Constitution that is worrying is Article 58. In Article 58, it says that the executive authority of Ghana shall vest in the president. All the executive authority of Ghana vest in one person. It doesn't say that they vest in the executive arm of government. It says they vest in the president. And within the context of the executive arm, the president appoints everyone, including the police IGP, including the military commanders, including the Kolebu teaching hospital boss, including the boss of Ridge Hospital. 6,000 appointments are delivered by the Ghanaian president under the 1992 constitution, not because it was a noble way to do things, but because it served the parochial interests of a group of people who were in power at that time, and he wanted to continue in power, and they had to make it smooth. They had to make a smooth transition for their boss, Flight Lieutenant Rawlings, and for themselves, as you heard Mr. Uh, Professor Kwame Nahoy say. So that's why we are where we are. Now, this uh, situation has also brings us now to our second pillar of the conversation. This situation of electing, having district assemblies the way they are, and by the way, uh, raise your hand to me if you, you think that the local government system in Ghana has worked. Everyone knows that the local government system in Ghana doesn't work. Nobody knows their district chief executive. The districts are emasculated from authority. They cannot collect taxes. If they do, they collect it from Ministry of Finance in Accra. They cannot do their own routes. They, they don't do anything. They don't do anything. The districts are disempowered from being able to do anything because everything points to the center. And so I'll show you tonight a few things that are, are quite disheartening. If you had the control of district assemblies uh, by political parties and uh, Kumasi metropolitan area has been won by the MPP and NDC is in power, the, the one who wins that is also able to collect the taxes. I think that's an argument that has not been made. If you become an elected district executive officer, you control the district. You are the president of that district. You share the power of, uh, of, of your presidency with your assembly. The president of Ghana sitting in, in Accra does not have a direct control over your district. You decide whether you want the taxes in your district to be yellow, blue, or red. You have your district assembly that operates like a district parliament, almost like a pseudo-federalism of sorts. That's what we are looking for. If you elect a district chief executive on partisan lines, and we'll come to why you should elect on partisan lines, because some of the no voters say that you should elect, but you should not elect on partisan lines. We'll come and deal with that. Listen to President Mahama here. He's talking about roads. Now, he's the president of Ghana, he's sitting at the center, and he has direct responsibility for constructing routes all across the country. That is a clear indication, the, the best indication you could get of the failure of the local government system in Ghana. The district assembly system has woefully failed. The local government authority system in Ghana for 35 years has failed. We know why it has failed, because it was created with the parochial interest. It doesn't work. That's what we have to change. And that's the opportunity that we are getting to change on 17 December. Listen to President Mahama. I must acknowledge the messages of appreciation we have received from the residents of Teshi Tebibiano. Does any of you live there? You know what is happening in that area. <laughs> Teshi Tebibiano and surrounding communities following the fast track rehabilitation of the road linking the area to the main Accra Tema Beach Road and is popularly called the Bush Road. Mr. Speaker, several roadworks are ongoing in Accra under the Urban Roads Project. And Mr. Speaker, 30 kilometers of road have been completed in the garden city of Kumasi. 30 kilometers. Ask your minority leader, he'll tell you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, for those of you who don't know, ask your minority leader, he'll tell you. 
Many of these roads are in the Swami and Asawasi constituencies. <laughs> so that's President Mahama in his State of the Nation address. And he's talking about roads and asking MPs, do you know there? Have you been there? Because that is the center of authority of Ghana. The parliament with the president in there becomes the center of the authority. The executive and the legislature are talking their power talk. And they are talking about roads that they may never go there. The roads that's their responsibility. Roads and basic development should always be the responsibility of the mayor, the local assembly, all over the world. That's what happens. Now, part of the reason why we have this acrimonious politics in our society is this. Because when we go to an election, and you lose the election as a political party, whether you're a small party or a big party, if you lose the election, the winner of that election takes everything. So we call it winner takes all. This 17th December will be the first opportunity to deconstruct the winner takes all situation that has been part and parcel of our politics. Our politics is acrimonious. And those, some of the people voting for, for no or asking for a no vote are saying that our politics is too acrimonious and therefore, we shouldn't bring it to the local level. This very uh, event is the panacea to the acrimonious politics. So we have to deconstruct the politics and have other parties, smaller parties, bigger parties, every other party winning something as far as the election is concerned, winning some form of executive authority. And therefore, Article 58 will be positively undermined so that the executive authority of Ghana shall not all vest in a single individual. So political parties can look at the election in Ghana, uh, the, the national election, and say that we have lost the presidency, we have lost the parliament, but we can win the Takrade municipality next year because those elections are not going to be held the same year. So they, they, somebody can say that we have lost the presidency, we have lost the parliament, but we can win the Kumasi Metropolitan Authority elections. When you win the Kumasi Metropolitan elections, what happens? You control Kumasi, you take the taxes in Kumasi, you show your creativity and innovation in Kumasi as a political party. Political parties are the vehicles for political expression. They could be independent candidates, yes, but all over the world. Political parties are the main expression of politics, are the main expression of ideas. So those people who don't like politics or who don't like politicians because of what you see in Ghana, that's going to change. That's going to change because the winner takes all is going to be broken. All of what you see is animated and engendered by the winner takes all conclusion. The winner takes all outcome. The winner takes all phenomenon is what brings about the acrimony, the pulling of knife, the killing, the blood that you see at parliamentary and presidential elections. Have a look at Nigeria. Have you considered the country Nigeria? Look at the size of Nigeria. The Nigeria is a huge country. Look at the number of people in Nigeria. And imagine why their politics is not as acrimonious as small Ghana. Nigerian politics doesn't pull the knives that we pull here. Nigerian politics doesn't have the insults that you have here. Because Nigerian politics is not a winner-takes-all situation. Human beings are the same. Self-preservation is the first, as we have been told by sociologists. And so when you have a winner-takes-all situation, even if you bring angels to participate in the election, you will have the phenomenon where people are going to say every death is death, where people are going to say this election, everybody will die, where people are going to say this election is do or die. You are going to have that kind of thing. You're going to have phenomenon where somebody says every this election, we are going to match them boot for boot. Because the winner of the election takes all. Look at Nigeria again. The winner doesn't take all. You know President Obasanjo, Olusegun Obasanjo, the famous two-time president of Nigeria. For the longest time that the most powerful Obasanjo was president, Lagos State was won by the opposition. So Lagos State, so that's the governor elections. So the governor of Lagos um, then controls Lagos. He takes the taxes of Lagos. He pays some duties to the national government, the central government, but he collects the taxes and runs Lagos. He can change Lagos the way he wants. This man on your screen here, Babatunde Fashola, was the governor of Lagos for the longest time that Obasanjo of PDP was president. His party, the opposition party, won Lagos all the time. So when his party, the ACP, goes to elections, and, and they lost the, the seat to Obasanjo, they lost the presidency to Chief Obasanjo. They were not worried because they were confident that they will always win Lagos. Now they are in power. The ACP is in power with Muhammad Buhari. One of the most powerful states in Nigeria is the River State. So River State, being one of the most powerful states in Nigeria currently, is not controlled by the government. It's controlled by the opposition PDP and is led by Ezenwo, Honorable Ezenwo Yensom Woke. 
uh, that's the name of the governor of River State. He won the governorship away from the main opposition party. What is the point about running these elections without partisanship? Those of you watching, tell me how many of you, as the district assemblies occurs without partisanship, how many of you have ever voted in a district assembly election? And compared to those of you who have ever voted in a parliamentary and presidential election, you vote in the parliamentary and presidential election because political parties drive it. You are interested in it because political parties drive it. Because political parties drive it, they own it. Political parties must drive the local government election. They are going to own the development for that region. We'll have a basis to test them. If Dr. Pakwesi Indum wins the district in Komenda Egunafo uh, Ekunfi, where he, he was most likely to win, his, his PPP party is most likely to win there because of Dr. Indum's big popularity, we now have the opportunity to see Dr. Indum at work as the executive, chief executive and mayor of that place. Let's see what roads he's going to build. Let's see what innovation is going to come up with taxes. And let's see that if Dr. Indum is able to do this, then he might be able to do better for the country. Dr. Indum was once a, a digital assembly, uh, a lab, uh, uh, what do you call it, an assemblyman. What did he achieve as assemblyman? Nothing. So he went to become an MP. The assembly elections that are held nonpartisan will not engender anyone to go and vote. It will continue to be the system that was created by Kwame Nahoy and Co. to serve the purposes of the military junta. Let us break down that system. Let the politicians come in. The acrimony will die, I can assure you. The acrimony will die out of the national elections if the NDC, the MPP, the CPP, and the PNC all know that they can grab some district in next year's election, what the Americans call the gubernatorial election. Have a look at what's happening in London right now now. Right now in London, in the United Kingdom, the government is held by the Conservatives. But London, their capital city, the mayor of London, Mr. Sadiq Khan, on your screen now, is with the Labour Party. Is that not beautiful? Labour Party controls London, the Conservative Party controls the government. That is what we mean by deconstructing and breaking the scourge of the winner-takes-all politics that has plagued Ghana and that has made our politics so acrimonious. The people who are looking at the acrimonious politics and are worried that this will come to a district level, the district level elections being partisan is the single most important panacea to break down the winner-takes-all and to take the acrimony out of the politics. There will be no boot for boot. There will be no all die be die. There will be no this election is do and die because this election will not be do and die. You win the presidential, you can win the parliamentary, I will always win the whole municipality. You win the presidential, you can win the parliamentary, I will always win KMA, Kumasi Metropolitan Authority. And when I win KMA, I will show that I have better ideas than you because of the way I will run KMA. And if I win the Takrade municipality, I will show that I have better ideas than you because of the way I run the Takrade municipality. These elections on partisan lines are also going to come with new laws that will include, for instance, as you have seen the Ministry of Education already do, education within the mayor's place will be the responsibility of the mayor. The bad roads we talk about in Ghana today is as a result of this matter. Have a look at the roads on your screen right now. These are some of the poorest roads in the world. They are found in Ghana. Why are they found in Ghana? Because in Ghana, the local authority is not responsible for the road. The road is to be done from Accra. Look at this map. Everybody's responsibility in terms of development is coming into Accra. From wherever you are, your development is coming into Accra. Accra must take the responsibility for your development. Taxes that are collected must be remitted to the Ministry of Finance. Everything must come through the Ministry of Finance. The local authority has nothing to do. Even the money that, they, that is allocated to them from the budget, the common fund sits in Accra. The common fund administrator is sitting in Accra to disperse the money that has been allocated by the law to the local government authorities. Why are you, what are you waiting for when you have this president that comes and says that the powers that the Constitution gives to me in Article 243, I no longer want to exercise those powers. I think the people must exercise the power themselves. You must go down there and vote, and vote according to party lines. Let's see what the MPP has in the district assemblies, and let's see what the NDC has. Let's look at what both of them are doing. Of course, that's also going to be a training ground for those who become politicians. British Prime Minister, current Prime Minister Bo uh, 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 Boris Johnson, current British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, used to be the mayor of London. He ran London so well that when he led the Conservative Party, everyone thought that because of what you've done in London, Boris Johnson can be Prime Minister. On the 12th of December, he's putting himself up in another election, and the bookmakers think that Boris Johnson is going to be re-elected 
for Prime Minister for the United Kingdom because Boris Johnson ran London so well. So this process is also going to be a training ground for people who think that they can run elections. We can now tell. We can now tell that when you run the mayor election in Kumasi, when you're a mayor of Takrade, when you're a mayor of Tamale, you're a mayor of Boligatanga, you're a mayor of Nangpandanduri, you're a mayor of, uh, of uh, Sisala, and you're a mayor of any town in the Bonafra region, you're a mayor of Kintampo, you're a mayor of that. When you did that, as an MPP mayor, as an NDC mayor, as a PNC mayor, as a CPP mayor, we understood what you did. Your creative ideas in collecting taxes, the way you apply the taxes, showed that you are a man who can run national office. This is what we are asking for. Bringing Ghanaian politics to the modernity of the world is what this uh, uh, referendum is about. The referendum in, on, on 17 December is to bring Ghanaian politics to the modernity of the world. If we vote a dangerous no, we are sending Ghana back to the table of discussion at the PNDC room in Gonda Barracks, where these clever men sat down together, Justice D.F. Anand, Mr. Kwame Nahoy, Kofi Tutubi Kwachi, Mr. Atu Ahoy, Guzi Tano, Peter Podugbe, they sat down in a room and they decided for us that we need to ease our military junta. Flights Lieutenant Rawlings, the lion in the room. We needed to ease the lion in the room from a military junta into a democratic leader. Let's create a constitution that makes him feel comfortable. And no vote is taking Ghana back to the decision-making table of the PNDC, the Provisional National Defense Council that created this local government system that has been a woeful and abysmal failure for 35 years. Ghanaians, let's rise up. Let's rise up and vote yes to change the course of our politics. Let's vote yes to break the winner takes all. Let's vote yes so that when we go into 2020's election, we don't go as boot for boot, we don't go as all die be die, we don't go as do and die. We go to the election knowing that if I lose the election, the presidential, and I lose the parliamentary, come in 2021, I can win the Takrade mayorship. Come in 2022, I can win the Kumasi mayorship. Come in 2021, I will win the Sisala mayorship, and I will be able to demonstrate the way in which I collect the taxes, the way in which I organize schools in Sisala, the way in which I organize hospitals in Sisala will be better organized. If you run this as nonpartisan, no one is going to be interested. We would have defeated that purpose. Already, we have, it has been proven that if you run nonpartisan, nothing happens. If you run as nonpartisan, you keep the winner takes all. We're going to go to next year's elections with knives. And the Electoral Commission be, was going to be in trouble because we're also going to pounce on them if they announce a result that shows that half a mark has been taken away from me. We don't want that in Ghana. We have come to our wit's end with the operation of the winner takes all situation. It came to, to, it, it, it came to a brink. We got to a brink in 2008. We have overcome that. Let us follow what this president is offering. And by the way, look at a country like Nigeria and look at the election. They don't pull knives. We pull knives. Nigeria doesn't pull knives. What is the reason? Because we have a winner takes all. And sociologists say self-preservation is the first, first initiative of man. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get out there and vote for a big yes. If you have any questions or any disagreement, send it to us on our Facebook page, Good Evening Ghana Official. We'll be delighted to answer it. I'm sure that this conversation is going to go on for a very long time. But let us vote a big yes on December 17th.